This is a paper called Diagrams of Desire, Psychoanalysis and Architecture for a Symposium on the Role of the Unconscious in the Architectural Imagination, sponsored by the Institute for Psychoanalytic Studies in Architecture. My name is John Shannon Hendricks. Desire for Lacan, as it is manifest in the mechanisms of language, is the attempt to attain or understand that which is missing from the being of the subject, which is the petit objet a, as he calls it. The objet a is that around which desire circulates, that upon which fantasy is constructed, and that which is the product of méconnaissance, or misconstruction. It is that which is excluded by signification and language, that of which the subject is deprived as it is solidified into a signifier and language. The elided subject in signification and the divided subject in language are the result of that which the subject can no longer be in rational discourse and the symbolic in the other. The objet a is present in the existence of everything that the ego neglects, scotomizes, misconstrues in the sensations that make it react to reality, everything that it ignores, exhausts, and binds in the significations that it receives from language, as Lacan describes in Aggressivity and Psychoanalysis. It is the residue of the illusion of consciousness, the mirage of objectification in the perception consciousness system as conceived by Freud. It is that which cannot be represented by the signifier those causes and forces which determine the subject and the unconscious to which the subject has no access. The objet a represents the inability of the subject to know itself in thought or in consciousness. The Lacanian subject can only say to itself either I do not think or I am not. There where I think I don't recognize myself. There where I am not is the unconscious. There, where I am, it is only too clear that I stray from myself. The objet a is thus the absent presence of the subject, the object of the subject's desire, which becomes the other person in imaginary ego, object identification, and reflection. <clears throat> the desire of the big other of Lacan, the desire of the subject in language, was transferred to the desire of the other. The other is objectified by the subject to compensate for its lack, the objet a. The objet a is the residue of the dialectic between the imaginary and the symbolic, the conflict between the identity of the subject as it is defined by its imaginary ego in object identification, and the identity of the subject as it is defined by the symbolic in its insertion into the big other, and the demands that the big other makes of the subject in relation to its phenomenal and imaginary experience. The big other is the unconscious, the matrix of language in which the subject is inserted. The demands of the symbolic are manifest in the unconscious as the discourse of the big other, <clears throat> to which the subject does not have access in itself, but which constitute the unknowable foundation of the conscious activities and thoughts of the subject. As the subject enters into the symbolic, into the signifying chain of language, the body of the subject is fragmented, and the experience of the body is divided in the gestalt ego identification resulting from the mirror stage. The objet a is that experience of the unified body of the subject, which is rendered impossible by language. The objet a of Lacan the body repressed by language is the tropic metonymic representation of the mythological totality of being that is lost by the subject when it is elided in the signifying chain in its representations to itself of its imaginary ideal ego. <clears throat> the objet a is the lack which is the cause of desire, the lack of being in existence, or in Hegelian terms, the self-negation of subjective spirit as it doubles itself into objective spirit. An object becomes an object of desire, as described by Lacan, when it takes the place, metonymically, as it is differentiated in language, of what by its very nature remains concealed from the subject. 
which is that which is repressed by language. The subject seeks the objet ah in fantasy and wish fulfillment as a result of the failure of all of its identificatory characteristics as defined by psychoanalysis to define it to itself. Neither the lost primordial phenomenological experience, the imaginary ego and object identification, the vestiges of the figural, nor the symbolic and language signification could compensate for the objet a, ah, which is what the subject lacks in all of its self-definitions. As a result of the division of the subject in imaginary and symbolic, and the formation of the object of desire as the displacement or compensation for the lack of the subject, the subject cannot fail to recognize that what he desires presents himself to him as what he does not want, the form assumed by the negation in which the méconnaissance, of which he himself is unaware, is inserted in a very strange way, which is a méconnaissance by which he transfers the permanence of his desire to an ego that is nevertheless intermittent and adversely protects himself from his desire by attributing it to these very intermittences as described by Lacan in the essay, The Subversion of the Subject and the Dialectic of Desire and the Freudian Unconscious. The object of desire is the stand-in for the objet a, which is concealed from the subject in its méconnaissance and the unconscious in the big other in the dialectic of interiority and the big other, subjective and objective. The subject knows that the object that it desires is not what it desires, but it does not know why, because the desire is reinforced by the ego, both the imaginary ego and the identification of the subject in the body and image of the other, and in the symbolic and the identification of the subject in relation to language and society, the historical and cultural, both of which assert themselves to the subject in temporal and periodic intervals as given by language and differentiation in the particular in order to reconfirm the existence of the subject as a desiring subject, although the cause of the desire and the object of the desire, the objet a, are inaccessible to the subject. Fantasy, the wish fulfillment caused by the objet a, is represented by Lacan in an algorithm which is the desire of the elided subject for the objet a, which is inaccessible to desire or wish fulfillment. Fantasy is the promise to the subject of that which is unattainable in its existence and being, and it protects the subject from the abyss within itself. The condition of the object of the fantasy, the objet a, is the moment of a fading or eclipse of the subject that is closely bound up with the spalton or splitting that it suffers from its subordination to the signifier, Lacan says. As soon as the subject enters into language, the attainment of the objet a is impossible. The subject is split between the imaginary and symbolic. The object identification of the imaginary ego provides the subject with the stand-in object of its desire in the illusion of consciousness and the ego, and the symbolic robs the subject of the stand-in object of its desire in the fragmentation of the body. The symbolic is resistant to the absorption of imaginary ego identifications, which survive as vestiges in dreams. Imaginary object identifications create an unconscious which is made of what the subject essentially fails to recognize in his structuring image, in the image of his ego, namely those captivations by imaginary fixations, which are unassimilable to the symbolic development of his history, Lacan says which are the interiority of the subject. The inability of the symbolic to absorb the imaginary results in the dialectic, the divided subject, and the méconnaissance of the subject. As the subject is unable to identify itself in the imaginary object identifications, which remain alien, alien to the symbolic constitution of the subject, the object or the other becomes exterior to the subject as a particular in the differentiation of reason and becomes the stand-in for the displaced objet a of the subject, which is nowhere to be found in language. Desire negates itself in the doubling of itself in language, just as thought does. Desire was defined by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in the letters to de Volder, 
as the action of the internal principle which brings about the change or the passing from one perception to another. Desire is that which is caught between perceptions or thoughts and language between signifiers and the signifying chain. Desire is thus as the trace or the index, that which is not present in language, but whose absence reveals the presence of the unconscious and the pulsating periodicity of the dialectic of absence and presence in language facilitated by the symbolic. It is true that the desire is not always able to attain the whole of the perception which it strives for, but it always attains a portion of it and reaches new perceptions, according to Leibniz. In the fluctuation of the ego and perception in the symbolic, consciousness is only present as a continuity in the illusion created by the ego. Desire for Lacan is caught in the dialectic of the imaginary and symbolic and rendered impossible, as the subject is rendered impossible. The object which stands in for the objet a, the lack in the subject, might be a fetish object or a collector's object, money, commercial products and advertising, sexual fantasies, identification with the big other in patriotism or racism, or displacements of the subject as the other and the big other, in the form of culturally conditioned desires, such as style, fashion, music, architectural forms, a certain profession or activity, etc. In advertising, commercial products are often represented as that which is unattainable. For example, Coca-Cola as the real thing, as pointed out by Zizek and the sublime object of ideology. The subject does not desire Coca-Cola. The subject desires the objet a, that which it lacks, which is the real thing, in the domain of the real, that which is inaccessible. The Lacanian subject desires as soon as it enters into language. Desire is not present in primordial imaginary experience prior to the mirror stage. Desire is the product of the murder of the thing by the symbol and language, which instigates the lack experienced by the subject, according to Lacan. The desire of the subject is thus the desire of the big other, and it is also the desire of the other person and the dialectic of the symbolic and imaginary. This can be seen in the desire of the dream, which is not a conscious desire, not regulated by the conscious ego. The dream enacts its own desire, which is the desire of the big other and the unconscious. In the same way, the conscious subject is the subject of the desire of the big other in language, rather than its originating agent. Consciousness is a construct of desire and the big other, which uses consciousness in its own regulation and concealment from the subject. In that the object of desire is a substitute for the objet a, the lack of the subject, the object is external to the desire of the subject. Desire is sustained by the subject and not by the object. The subject is an apparatus of absence in which the objet a is constituted. This apparatus is something lacunary, and it is in the lacuna that the subject establishes the function of a certain object qua lost object, Lacan says. The object of desire is a fill-in for the lacuna in the subject, for the whole in the signifying chain which represents the subject. The desire of the subject is supported by fantasy. The fantasy is the support of desire. It is not the object that is the support of desire. The subject sustains himself as desiring in relation to an ever more complex signifying ensemble. As desire is the desire for, of the big other, desire is socially engendered through the language of the symbolic. The subject does not want what it desires, but desires what it thinks it is supposed to desire as a speaking subject in order to sustain itself in language. The object of desire in the usual sense is either a fantasy that is in reality the support of desire, Lacan says, the reaffirming by the ego of the subject that is desiring what it is supposed to desire, or lure the deception of the subject by its ego that the object is what it is supposed to desire. The desire of the subject is divided in metonymy, which reaffirms the subject as that which is represented in language, and at the same time eliminates the subject from that representation. Desire is both reaffirmed and negated by language, because desire is constructed by language, by the discourse of the big other, which is the unconscious. <laughs>
The subject is only partially existent in the big other, and thus only partially existent in its own desire, which is inaccessible to it, as is the unconscious. The desire of the big other is that which links the signifiers in a signifying chain, and that which results in the elimination of the subject. The subject of Lacan is alienated from itself in signification. It is alienated from its own desire and language by language. The subject, as in the Hegelian subject, is self-alienated in the doubling of its reason, in the doubling of the signifier which produces signification, and which institutes the objet a in language as the lack of the subject, the self-negation of the subject in reason, and its self-alienation in its language. As soon as the subject speaks, it desires, and as soon as the subject desires, it does not know itself, and its méconnaissance is sustained by its desire. As soon as the signifier represents a subject to another signifier, the subject is alienated from itself in its desire. Alienation is linked in an essential way to the function of the dyad of signifiers, Macon says. As soon as the alienation is accomplished in the singular representation of the subject by a signifier to another signifier, <coughs> The subject is eliminated from any further signification, which becomes self-enclosed and inaccessible to the subject. The subject cannot access that by which it is constituted. If we wish to grasp where the function of the subject resides in this signifying articulation, we must operate with two, because it is only with two that he can be cornered in alienation. As soon as there are three, the sliding becomes circular, Lacan says. The alienation is accomplished with the binary signifier, as the signifier is that which represents the subject for the other signifier. The binary signifier is also the mechanism of the Borstelung's represent, representants uh, of the dream. The representation which takes the place of the representation is the signifier which takes the place of the signifier, which represents the subject to it. The subject is alighted in the dream in the same way is the entered drucken of the binary signifier. The subject is thus self-alienated self from its desire in the dream as well, and in saphonisis, which is a product of the Borstelung's representants, as the illusion of the subject is a product of the binary signifier in conscious discourse, in which the mechanisms of the unconscious metaphor and autonomy determine the subject unknown to itself. The mathematical linguistic mechanisms and signification, which is the function of desire and the maintenance of the, maintenance of the ego, reveals the real and the gap between signifiers and the trace or index. For desire merely leads us to aim at the gap where it can be demonstrated that the one based only on the essence of the signifier is based, as the con explains. It is signification which reveals that which cannot be signified and the desire of the subject which reveals the non-existence of the subject. Desire is the mechanism of its own non-existence as it is perpetuated by the illusion of object identification and the imaginary ego and the illusion of the consciousness of the subject in language and the symbolic. It is impossible to establish a relation between cause and effect. The signifier can only have a relation to the second signifier in the binary relation and there is a gap between the two signifiers in that relation, as in the relation between the, the numbers 1 and 2, in which is found the trace of further signification, for example, 1 plus 2 equals 3. 1 and 2 alone constitute no signification, no intersection of the imaginary and symbolic. They correspond to the object identification of the imaginary ego prior to the entry of the subject into language. <clears throat> 1 and 2 alone constitute the gap between the two, between the one and signification, in which is found the objet a, which causes signification as compensation for its lack. The objet a constitutes the inaccessibility, inaccessibility of the real to signification. The signifier, as constituted by the objet a, as the mechanism of the lack, is the inaccessibility of the big other. The objet a is essential to the functioning of language and essential to the impossibility of representation. The interconnected structures of the imaginary, symbolic, and real of the clan 
which describe the psyche and language separated yet interconnected in a Borromean knot <clears throat> can also be found in vision, which is a function of language or reason. Consciousness is given by vision, by the subject seeing itself in the mirror in the imaginary, and by the subject being seen by the other in the symbolic. The vision of the primordial imaginary is prior to perception, prior to the intersection of vision and language. The vision of the symbolic is the imaginary vision absorbed into language, into perception, and the dialectic of the imaginary and symbolic is manifest in desire. Hegel designed perception, or picture thinking, or Vorstelung, as a synthetic combination of sensuous immediacy and its universe, universality or thought in the phenomenology of spirit, the imaginary and symbolic. Matter, the particular, or the one in self-differentiation, can only participate in the universal in thought through perception, according to Hegel. It is through perception that spirit becomes self-conscious and subjective spirit is differentiated in objective spirit and the consciousness of passing into otherness in the words of Hegel. Through perception, the world is created as otherness and the otherness of reason to itself. Universal principles are differentiated into particulars in the dissolution of their simple universality and the parting asunder of them into their own particular, uh, particularity, according to Hegel, through the mechanism of desire in the objet a. The self-alienation of reason and consciousness, the divided subject, is predicated on the relation of the subject as differentiation and reason to itself as reason itself or consciousness. Thus consciousness maintains the illusion of the presence of the subject to itself as other to its own differentiation and reason. The objet a of the Khan is the point at which the subject becomes alienated from itself as the juncture between the symbolic and the real. The objet a is the lack which moves the subject from point to point in the signifying structure. In the perception and vision of Lacan, in the relation between the subject and the world which is constituted by vision and ordered in the figures of representation, perception can be compared to reason as a succession of particular, particulars and differentiation <clears throat> driven by desire in the objet a, in which the subject is only present as lack. As in language, there is a hole between signifiers, a gap which is the objet a in perception. Something slips, passes, is transmitted from stage to stage, and it is always to some degree eluded in it, as in the trace in deeper ross. This is what we call the gaze, Lacan says in the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis. The gaze is the objet a of vision, a vision as vision can be defined as the discourse of the big other, as the unconscious. The unconscious is present as an absence in perception and vision in the same way that the unconscious is present as an absence in language and reason. The gaze is a function of perception and vision as opposed to vision itself or optical sensation. Perception is a product of consciousness, the self-sustaining illusion of the ego in its existence to itself. Thus, everything in perception is pre-inscribed by the ego, by consciousness. Everything in perception is given by consciousness as a pre-existence to the seen of a given to be seen, Lacan says, in the same way that signification and language cannot exceed consciousness, that the unconscious is present only in absence. Absence. The objet a in perception is defined by Lacan as the stain in vision, that which occurs in the gaze, the holes in vision. We will then realize that the function of the stain and of the gaze is both that which governs the gaze most secretly, as the objet a governs the lacunae in language in the subject, <clears throat> and that which always escapes from the grasp of that form of vision that is satisfied with itself, in imagining itself as consciousness, Lacan says, which is perception, as the objet a escapes conscious discourse. <clears throat> In perception, consciousness enacts the play of mere reflections of signification as objects participate in the universal, as particulars in the process of differentiation, as in the play of differences in différence, or the glissement of the signifier in signifiance. <clears throat>
self-consciousness and perception, the doubling of reason and its recognition of its otherness to itself, is the seeing oneself seeing oneself, the continual reaffirmation of consciousness by the ego in the signification of perception. Such reaffirmation expresses the objā, the lack in the subject which is the cause of its desire, which is the function of the gaze, the lacuna, to reveal. In the theory of vision, <clears throat> it is possible to conceive an, alter an alternative to perception and vision, whereas in the theory of language it is not possible to conceive of an alternative to conscious discourse and communication, because while perception is structured by language or signification, it has no communicative intent, as in the dream. The unconscious can be revealed in means of vision outside of perception in the same way that it can be revealed in the composition of dreams outside of conscious experience, as shown by Freud, as dreams are uh, as well shown to be structured by language, the discourse of the big other, which is the unconscious, which can be seen in vision as well. <coughs> the gaze shows itself in the dream, in the absence of the subject, and in the absence of the organization of the imaginary space of the dream by the subject in perception. Dream space and dream images are structured differently than vision and perception. In perception, the image of the subject, the gestalt, orthopedic, self-reflected body image formulated in the mirror stage, is the orienting point for the construction of perception by the subject as the imaginary ego in object orientation and language. As a vanishing point in perspective construction, everything in perception is oriented to the subject and organized in accordance. Spatial recession, hierarchies of scale, vertical and horizontal differentiations as a grid placed on the world as if there were a grid on the luminous embroidered veil in Plato's Republic. The structuring of what is seen in perception is given by the structuring of language when the imago of the primordial imaginary experience is transformed into a mechanism for the ordering of the psyche, when the fragmentary and dispersed quality of what is seen and experienced prior to the mirror stage is reconstituted in relation to the subject, the imaginary ego, and reordered to correspond to the symbolic and language. As the subject is elided from vision, as the distinction between subject and object in exterior and interior are dissolved, so are the distinctions between the real and the imaginary, between waking and sleeping, between ignorance and knowledge. As described by Roger Kewa in Mimicry and Legendary Psychocenia, in which the necessity of mind is fused with the necessity of the universe. In dreams, the particular quality of the image is that it does not correspond to the perception of the subject inserted into language, although linguistic structures are seen to compose the dream. The symbolic is present in the dream, and the latent content in the dream, the dream thought, is revealed by Freud, and the imaginary is present in the dream, as images in the dream are products of the object identification of the subject, and there is a transformative process between the latent and manifest content of the dream, as Freud has shown, between the symbolic and imaginary, as it were. The difference between the dream and waking perception seems to be that the interaction between the symbolic and imaginary, which constitutes the subject and constant conscious perception, is missing in the experience of the dream. As dream images or the vorst de lungs represent Tanzen, the representation which takes the place of the mnemic residue, the connection between the symbolic and imaginary is lost between the mnemic residue and the vorst de lungs represent Tanzen. The imaginary is not <clears throat> subsumed into and repressed by the symbolic as it is in conscious perception. The dream represents more of an equal partnership given the lack of requirement for communication and relation with the other in the dream. Conscious perception is always in reference to the relation with the other, the object identification of the imaginary, which is only a fragment or a residue absorbed into the symbolic, as the subject is inserted into the big other, the network of language and relations. The dream image is a product of the relation between the subject and the big other, but the structuring of the relation between the subject and the other in relation to the big other, the imaginary in relation to the subject, is not present in the dream. The subject is not present in the dream as it is not present in language, 
only as an absence, a sliding away, as described by Lacan, and the gaze is present in the dream as the lacuna in signification and the disjunction between the imaginary and symbolic. The presence of the gaze is manifest in the dream, as described by Lacan, and the absence of horizon, horizon, the enclosure of that which is contemplated in the waking state, which are products of perception, the intersection of the imaginary and symbolic, and also the character of emergence, of contrast, of stain, of its images, the intensification of their colors. The images in the dream represent themselves uh, differently from images in perception. In the interpretation of dreams, Freud describes, describes dream images as competing in intensity and superimposition, and color impressions are given hallucinatory clarity in relation to the nemic residues. In on dreams, dreams are described as disconnected fragments of visual images. Dream images do not appear in relation to the insertion by the subject of itself into the field. They are independent of the interaction between a representation of the subject and the Vorstellung's representanzen, though the object identifications of the subject are present in the dream. The position of the subject in the dream, then, for Lacan, is profoundly that of someone who does not see. The subject does not see where it is leading, he follows. The dream is not a product of perception organized in relation to the subject. Seeing and perception is impossible in the dream. The subject will never be able to apprehend itself in the dream in the way in which, in the Cartesian cogito, he apprehends himself as thought, Lacan says. <clears throat> the relation between the imaginary and the symbolic, which places the subject as a reference point in relation to the other, is the con in the constructed perception of the big other, does not exist in the dream, and as a result the gaze is revealed, the lacuna in the field of perception, which contains the absence of the subject in the symbolic, and the lack of the subject in the imaginary, which is the stain, or the objet a, which is elided in perception, as it is based on the cogito, as the unconscious is elided in signification. And that the cogito is given by the illusion of consciousness, the subject is the consciousness of perception, but the subject cannot be the consciousness of the dream and the distinction between the imaginary and symbolic. In the 1924 essay, Perspective as Symbolic Form, Erwin Panofsky proposed an alternative to the constructed space of perception and waking thought in its perspectival or geometrical organization, which he called psychophysiological space, as an evocation of the possibility of dream space and conscious representation. The space of perception was characterized by Panofsky as infinite, unchanging, and homogeneous in a systematic abstraction. The cogito applies an unchanging structure to space and perception and consciousness oriented to the subject. The space is infinite because it is metaphysical, based on the dialectic of the imaginary and symbolic. In perspective space, for example, space is organized according to a vanishing point, which is the point of the infinite recession of space. As the structure of space in perception is infinite, unchanging, and homogeneous for Panofsky, it is quite unlike the structure of psychophysiological space, the space which is conceived as corresponding to dream space. <clears throat> Exact perspectival construction is a systematic abstraction from the structure of this psychophysiological space. Psychophysiological space is seen as more of a tastrum, a haptic space of immediate sensations, pre preserving the primordial imaginary experience prior to language. Such a concept is suggested in the philosophy of symbolic forms of Ernst Cassirer, or in Ernst Mach's treatise of 1914, the analysis of sensations and the relation of the physical to the psychical. The intention of psychophysiological space is no longer to represent death intervals extensively by means of foreshortenings and to create an illusion intensively by playing color surfaces off against each other, as Panofsky describes. Psychophysiological space is also manifest in the conception of space of Kaiwa and the necessity of the mind which is also a place where the brain meets the universe, or the necessity of the mind corresponds to the necessity of the universe. Fusing perfectly with the necessity of the universe, Kaiwa writes in 1933, 
the mind's necessity would at the same time be absorbed in it. Space is seen by Kaiwa as that which can be occupied by multiple representations, as in a mirror and that in what is behind it, in contrast to the homogeneity of perspective space, uh, <clears throat> and more than one object can also be apprehended in the same location. The visual space of Kaiwa is the product of the interaction of perception and imagination, imagination being composed of the same mnemic residues as in the dream and the hallucination. Vision is seen as a combination of the perception given by consciousness and the production of the Vorstelung's representanzen given by unconscious processes. Perception gives a virtual image to which the imagination opposes a real content, the imaginary content of the unconscious. Imagination is often defined as virtual perception given by the mnemic residues in the mind, and perception as a real imagination structured by the discourse of the big other, the unconscious. In the interaction of perception and imagination, the homogeneous and unchanging space of constructive perception gives way to sporadic fluctuation and variance. In the article Mimicry and Legendary Psychosenia, space is seen by Kaiwa, Kaiwa as a double dihedral changing at every moment in size and position. The dihedral is the oscillating intersection of horizontal and vertical planes. Vertical planes are the action of the perceived subject and perceiving subject and perceived object in space, while horizontal planes are the action of the ground under the subject and the representation of the ground under the subject. The perceiving subject of Kaiwa is no longer seen as a fixed point in relation to what is perceived, but constantly moving and changing, as are the objects which are perceived and the ground on which the perception takes place. The oscillation is the instability of interiority and the absence of the symbolic and the imaginary. The perception of Kaiwa entails the interaction of the imaginary and symbolic, but the residues of imaginary object identification are allowed more of a presence within the symbolic and the suspension of the symbolic, the association of the subject to the other. Horizontal planes are projected <coughs> on the vertical planes as in parametrics. The subject of Kaiwa in psychophysiological space is thus disposed of its privilege and literally no, no longer knows where to place itself. The perpetual fluctuation of the double dihedral of psychophysiological space can be seen as the perpetual play of differences and différence or significance. The play of difference, uh, the play of absences and presences, which dislocate the subject from what is signified as in psychophysiological space. Such a space is thus seen as a constitution of human knowledge, where certainty and invariance are impossible in a fluctuating world where there is no appreciable difference between the known and the unknown, and as described in the, in the necessity of the mind, <coughs> suggesting the laceration of the signifying structure of Bataille, the laceration of the lacerated nature. In the dissolution of the subject in space, distinctions are dissolved, between the real and imaginary, between waking and sleeping, between ignorance and knowledge, as described in mimicry and legendary psychosenia. There is no appreciable difference between the conscious and the unconscious. As phenomenally perceived images fluctuate in the tastrum, the conscious and the unconscious fluctuate. In the interaction of the conscious and unconscious, the dominance of the symbolic is overcome and the limitations of language. The self-identity of the subject for Kaiwa is limited by the abstraction, generality, and permanence of the meaning of words. Identity is found instead in the mobile nature of the realities of a consciousness, which intersects with the unconscious and the growing multiplicity of perceptions and sensations. Identity is found in a lyrical language, which is experienced directly through dreams. The structure of Kaiwa's uh, psychophysiological space can be seen in Lacan's conception of the picture and the gaze, which con consists of vacillation, discontinuity, the interruption of conscious perception by the unconscious, and the elision of the subject. The vacillation is the manifestation of desire and signification, and the gaze is the point of failure of the subject in the objet a, the inaccessible object of desire, but which is imperceptible in conscious perception. The gaze plays the same role as the vanishing point in perspective construction, 
as the bar between the signifier and the signified, and the moment of the pointe capitant and the retroactive anticipation of the subject signification plays the same role as the RK in language, as does the trace. In the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, insofar as the gaze qua objet a may come to symbolize the central lack expressed in the phenomenon of castration, loss of ego, and insofar as it is an objet a reduced of its nature to a punctiform evanescent function, it leaves the subject in ignorance as to where there, what there is beyond the appearance and the ex inaccessibility of the unconscious, unconscious an, an, an ignorance so characteristic of all progress in thought that occurs in the way constituted by philosophical research. But psychoanalysis is neither a Weltanschauung in the ideology or philosophy of life, nor a philosophy that claims to provide the key to the universe. It is governed by a particular aim, which is historically defined by the elaboration of the notion of the subject. It poses this notion in a new way by leading the subject back to his signifying dependence, Lacan says. When the subject sees itself, seeing itself in consciousness, the perception of the subject cannot be absorbed into vision, as in the psychophysiological space of Kaiwa. The presence of the subject in vision through perception is given by the cogito, the self-certainty of the presence of the subject, results in the flocculation of the subject, the reduction of the subject to the punctiform object of the vanishing point, and thus the annihilation of the subject as the subject is alighted in signification and language. As the subject is the punctiform object in perception, it is as the objet a as the punctiform object in the gaze. Consciousness is linked to desire as the inverse of desire, that which both is sustained by desire and which conceals desire. So it is that consciousness, in its illusion of seeing itself seeing itself, finds its basis in the inside-out structure of the gaze, Lacan says, as a product of the desire which it seeks to repress. The objet a is given by the fragmentation which occurs in the subject in the mirror stage and the incompatibility between the variability of primordial sense experience and the imaginary ego of gestalt object identification, which produces the impossible object of desire in the subject as it is translated into the demand of the big other in language in the symbolic. As a result, the interest the subject takes in its own split is bound up with that which determines it, namely a privileged object which has emerged from some primal separation, from some self-mutilation induced by the very approach of the real, whose name in our algebra is the objet a, Lacan says. The objet a is the lost identity of the subject in relation to itself, in its self-alienation in both the imaginary and the symbolic. As the gaze is the inverse of consciousness, the fantasy or imagination of the subject depends on the gaze and its vacillation in the same way that consciousness is sustained by the ego. The subject attempts to identify with the gaze, gaze and vision with its own lack, as it attempts to identify with the vanishing point of perspective construction, which is both the reaffirmation of its consciousness and the reaffirmation of its own lack in relation to what is beyond appearance. Like the vanishing point, the gaze is inapprehensible, as the unconscious is inapprehensible. But from the moment that this gaze appears, the subject tries to adapt himself to it. He becomes that punctiform object, the point of vanishing being with which the subject confuses his own failure, the con says, the point at which the consciousness of the subject cannot exceed itself, which is reinforced by the interpretation of the unconscious. The gaze can only be experienced in consciousness as mes connaissances in the inaccessibility of the unconscious to conscious thought. The gaze, as it is revealed in the dream, and as it might be represented in conscious visual experience, is not accessible to conscious thought and can only be known as an absence, as the subject itself, which identifies itself with the gaze. For this reason, the subject seeks to symbolize his own vanishing and punctiform bar in the illusion of consciousness seeing oneself see oneself in which the gaze is alighted in Lacan's words as in the doubling of reason and the self-consciousness of Hegel. 
The subject is alighted both in the gaze, in the presence of the gaze, and in the consciousness in which the gaze is alighted, because the experience of vision for Lacan cannot entail other than the interaction of the imaginary and symbolic in the primordial fragmentation of the subject. The gaze appears to the subject that is sustaining himself in a function of desire and vision as given by consciousness and signification. The subject recognizes its lack in the gaze, but only as it is given by signification. The gaze is that which escapes perception as a function of desire and consciousness through signification, that which forces the subject out of that perception, for example, an anamorphosis or trump loyal and representation, which can only be products of representation, thus products of conscious mechanisms, which, after a moment of shock, when the subject realizes that it does not exist, only serve to reinforce the existence of the subject in the consciousness, which is sustained by desire and signification. As soon as the gaze is sought, it disappears. In any picture, it is precisely in seeking the gaze in each of its points that you will see it disappear, Lacan says. The gaze in the dream, as a product of the Vorst de Lung's representanzen, is again not an impediment to the identity of the subject as it is formed in the perception consciousness system. In the same way that the seeking, speaking subject, the symbolic, is created and manipulated by language, represented by a signifier to another signifier, so the viewing subject is created and manipulated by perception. Lacan proposes that the geometrical dimension enables us to glimpse how the subject who concerns us is caught, manipulated, captured in the field of vision by perception. That which is perceived is always a trap, always a labyrinth, created by geometrical relations, the line, the plane, the solid. The only point in the geometrical construction of what is perceived which can suggest what is beyond appearance, as it has been seen that the gaze cannot do that, is the point of light. It is not in the straight line, but in the point of light, the point of irradiation, the play of light, fire, the source from which reflections pour forth, where the essence of the relation between appearance and being, which the philosopher conquering the field of vision so easily masters, lies, as Lacan says. Light suggests that the subject for Lacan is something other than the punctiform object in the geometrical, geometrical, construction, geometrical uh, construct of perspective or perception. There's something in the subject which is other to the picture. In the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, the picture certainly is in my eye, but I am not in the picture. There is something in the subject as given by light, which is something other than constructed perception. This is something that introduces what was elided in the geometrical relation, the depth of field with all its ambiguity and variability, which is in no way mastered by me. It is rather it that grasps me, solicits me at every moment, and makes of the landscape something other than a landscape, something other than what I have called the picture, Lacan says. There is something outside of conscious experience and vision, outside the signifying construction of perception, and the relation between the subject and the world, which is suggested to the subject by light. The gaze corresponds to the location of a picture of the constructed perception outside of the subject, although it is given by the consciousness of the subject. The gaze is the gap in perception, the lacuna or scotomata or scotoma, which situates it outside of consciousness. In between the gaze, outside conscious perception, and the construct of conscious perception is the screen, which mediates between the two. The screen is something other than geometrical or optical space, and it is opaque. It cannot be traversed, as the bar and language cannot be traversed between signification and what is outside of signification, or what is alighted by signification, but which makes signification possible, that is, the subject. The gaze is a play of light and opacity, because it is the dialectic of the universal in particular, the symbolic and the imaginary. It is that which, in the field of light, seduces the subject toward that which is other to it in its self-negation, but which prevents the subject from access to what is other to it, the unconscious. Light prevents the subject from being the screen. The subject cannot go outside itself, outside its identity and signification, in perception. That which is other to the subject, which must always be exterior to the subject, 
reaffirming its self-identity and consciousness, or the light within it, its interiority. If the subject were the screen in a field of vision, which is pure light, it would dissolve into light. Light would dissipate uncontrollably into matter, and matter would be dissolved into its iridescence, the shifting changes of colors resulting from the insertion of light into matter. As a result, the point of gaze always participates in the ambiguity of the jewel, Lacan says. Light is present in the jewel only as reflection, as differentiation, although it cannot be distinguished from the facets of the jewel. Light flickers in the jewel as it flickers in the spaces of vision, as the possibility of what is other to perception, but it is always reflected and never reveals its source. As light for Lacan prevents the subject from being the screen, the subject is the screen and the picture, that which mediates between consciousness and what is outside of consciousness in the constructed perception. As the screen is consciousness, the subject prevents itself from access to the unconscious, from access to its own identity. This is the relation of the subject with the domain of vision, Lacan says. The unconscious is revealed to the subject by the gaze, and what is other than consciousness is revealed to the subject by light, but the subject can only be grasped and solicited, tempted by what is other to it. The subject is the picture or vision in relation to the gaze, as the subject is that which the signifier represents to another signifier and signification. The gaze determines the subject in the visible, as the subject is solicited by it. The subject enters light and vision through the gaze, through that which is other to geometrical perception, and it is through the gaze that light is embodied in the intersection of the symbolic and imaginary. As in signification, the metaphysic is displaced from the dialectic between appearance and what is beyond appearance to the symbolic and the imaginary, the splitting in the subject, which is revealed in the gaze, the lacuna or scotoma and vision. Indeed, there is something whose absence can always be observed in a picture, vision, which is not the case in perception, according to Lacan, and self-enclosed signification. In Freudian terminology, the gaze is the primordial void around which the drive circulates, the lack that assumes positive existence in the shapeless form of the thing, the Freudian das Ding, the impossible, unattainable substance of enjoyment of the self-identity of the subject, as described by Zizek in Looking Aright. 